I'm Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech. We're talking about global connections right now. And uh, we're talking about uh, the new security law in Hong Kong, which doesn't mean security at all, with Michael Davis and, uh, and Victoria Hui, both skilled, skilled in Hong Kong, having spent years there. So welcome to the show, Michael and Victoria. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Okay, we're going to talk about what happened in Hong Kong over the past few days. And it's a sad discussion. It's a sad show because uh, the, the Chinese uh, PRC has, has been writing notes, taking notes on what's happened up to this point, and they really have come down with a clamp. Why is, this, why is this clamp different from all the other clamps, Michael? Well, this time around, they, you know, they're no longer hiding behind Hong Kong officials. They've taken direct charge in Hong Kong of law enforcement. And in doing so, they are literally uh, imposing a kind of mainland style uh, control over what goes on in Hong Kong with warrantless searches, secret surveillance. They've mobilized a, Hong Kong, a committee in Hong Kong under the chief executive uh, to issue rules and regulations, allowing the police to do pretty much anything they want to do uh, without judicial restraint uh, in most cases. Uh, and it's interesting today, they issued two regulations under this, but there's no way they could have written these regulations, which go on for pages and pages about how they're going to control everything. They could not issue them, write them uh, in the last week. These had to have been written in Beijing and handed to them. Uh, this committee in Hong Kong on safeguarding national security has a mainland appointed advisor and it answers to the central people's government. So everything it does basically is being dictated in Beijing. Uh, we know that uh, on the very first day this law came into force, uh, 370 people were arrested, 10 of them arrested under this national security law. A guy who uh, approached the police uh, on his motorcycle with a flag was arrested, uh, basically a flag declaring uh, something they don't wanna hear, was arrested for terrorism. So this is, uh, there's no fooling around. This is really by a kind of communist regime uh, taking over an open society playbook. Uh, so Victoria, they say this is good for you, uh, that everybody's gonna learn to live with this uh, and that, that people will be happy once they get used to it. What do you think? Well, first of all, to go back to your the title of today is that this is you know, really not about national security. I say that this is not about national security, this is about regime security, it is about Xi Jinping's own power security. And therefore, if we understand that, then we can see why this law is so harsh. And uh, I also, also want to quote Jerry, uh, Jerry Cohen, basically the Dean of China Law. He said that this is not a second handover, this is a Chinese takeover of Hong Kong. Essentially, we are going to see with all these new laws and regulations, not just that, Beijing has destroyed Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's one country, two systems. Because some people may say that, well, if you know it's one country, two systems, and then maybe Hong Kong is just going to be more like Shenzhen or Shanghai. And Shenzhen and Shanghai have been thriving, so you know, what's the fear? And we know that in, in, in Shanghai and Shenzhen, a lot of people do live happily. So what's, the, what's, what's wrong with it? The problem is that in Shenzhen and, and Shanghai, the majority of the people do buy the regime's uh, bargain that you make money and keep your mouth shut. Now, why this is not going to happen in Hong Kong or not the design is that, to, uh, especially with today's new announcements, that the regime also seems to want to, you know, if you are subject to any of those criminal charges of subversion, uh, secession, terrorism, and collusion, you also, you're under so constant surveillance, you don't, they don't need to get any court warrant. They can freeze your assets, they can even confiscate your assets. And at the point when even the right to private property, not just the right to free speech is taken away, how can everyone live happily thereafter? And, and well, you know, it's, it strikes me that, um, you know, had we waited, had Xi Jinping and the Politburo waited until 2047, um, we might have expected a, 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 what do you call it, a more civilized transition. But they accelerated that. And not only did they accelerate it, but they made it really draconian. Am I right about this? This is worse than would it have been, than it would have been had it just gone the normal course. They couldn't wait. Well, the one thing is that 
and many people will say, you know, if Hong Kong is going to be part of China by 2047, if you're going to die someday, you know, what is, does it make any difference if you're going to die sooner, or 2050 <laughs> or that later? It does make a difference for most people. And then another thing is that for a long time, the idea was not that the promise to Hong Kong was not that, you know, you guys have only a lifespan of 50 years. But after 50 years, China is going to become like Hong Kong. And therefore, there will not be any need to protect Hong Kong from the mainland system. Now, everything has been sped up. And also that well, the, the way that the national security law has been imposed in Hong Kong, it's really a the nuclear option. Beijing could have done it in another way. For example, by May, they managed to just push aside the democratically elected legislators who were doing filibuster of the national anthem law. They just kicked out those guys they didn't like and then formed their own committee. And so it was passed in no time. So Beijing could have done the same thing um, uh, with the national security law, but they chose the most draconian way. So I think all gloves are off. Yeah, but why, Michael? Why, why have they taken such an aggressive stance? Was it necessary? Uh, this is obviously going to you know, create big problems in Hong Kong and for the world to watch. I think this is a case of, of how they categorize Hong Kong. They categorize Hong Kong as one of those peripheral areas of China uh, that's a national security problem in their views. And, and it could be Xi Jinping's security or the Communist Party in general, which uh, she, she treats as the same thing. And so Victoria's point earlier that this isn't, that Hong Kong isn't becoming Shanghai. No, it's becoming Xinjiang or Tibet. It's becoming one of those border regions of China where the regime knows that nobody there really, the local people don't like them at all. And so the local people have to be contained and repressed. That's the model that's being applied, not, not the model of make Hong Kong more like other Chinese cities. Because uh, other Chinese cities, as Victoria pointed out, aren't populated with people that are out to throw the, overthrow the regime. So this is how they view Hong Kong. And so they've created a surveillance state and these, it's chilling to read the regulations that they've issued today under this law. The law itself was chilling enough, but now the regulations they're issuing essentially give policemen and law enforcement officers carte blanche to do pretty much anything they want to do to silence the internet, to surveil you without you knowing it, to search your premises without a warrant, uh, and to arrest you and charge you. And if they charge you under this law, the latter part of the law uh, allows for the setting up in Hong Kong of an office for the safeguarding of national security that's to be staffed by members of the Public Security Bureau in the mainland. We don't know how many of these people will be in Hong Kong, but they're gonna be there and on their own, they're not subject to the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. On their own, they can decide that what you're doing should be tried not in Hong Kong, but in mainland China and you'll be taken across the border with no right to have a judge oversee the legitimacy of your arrest. What and about the extradition controversy only a few months ago? Well, this makes extradition law look like child's play. This is really no longer having to ask the Hong Kong government as the extradition law seemed to give the chief executive a lot of power. Of course, that may be meaningless distinction because the chief executive is clearly taking all instructions from the central government. She's in effect part of it, part of the central government. And so now they will do all these things as they please. And, and there's a, a, an article in there that prohibits uh, a kind of collusion with foreign forces. Beijing always believes when people resist their rule that there's foreign collusion. Uh, they can't imagine that people would simply not want the, the, the kind of governance they provide. So there must be foreign collusion. And now, basically, if you consult or get advice from an international human rights organization, you could be charged with collusion. I'm very much worried about many friends who work for NGOs on human rights in Hong Kong. And I'm sure they're worried as well, because that could be treated as foreign collusion. Isn't this, isn't, doesn't this go beyond the borders of Hong Kong? Isn't it possible that somebody could be outside of Hong Kong and charged under this law? I mean, you, you, for example, if you speak against the PRC uh, and, and here in the United States, theoretically, you're violating this law. Can you go back, Michael? 
Well, that's the big question we don't know. And a lot of academics, Amer foreign, the universities in Hong Kong are among the top rated universities in Asia. Many of them ranked among the top in the world because they have international faculties, high levels of academic freedom that distinguishes them. Uh, and so they're, and they have acceptable salaries. So a large portion of their faculties are foreigners. And so now there's a big question, what is the impact even on universities there? Will they be degraded because foreign faculty members are fearful of coming in? Now I'm, I'm a person who comes regularly to teach in Hong Kong. Uh, and I, there's a judgment gonna have to be made, I guess, about what, what, you know, whether I can go there and teach. I would say Victoria, because she's uh, even more active on these issues than I am, pretty much has concluded that she can't return to Hong Kong now uh, unless something changes because- Victoria, can we talk about that? Uh, in, in Notre Dame, you, you have spoken on this issue. Uh, you and Michael both, uh, I guess it's a fundamental point for the two of you. Uh, you. Can you go back? Do you recommend he go back? Would you, you both go back? Or are you in danger to go back? Are you in danger to, to be here in the United States under this law which reaches so far? This is a very important question. Essentially, Beijing, uh, uh, one of the clauses says that this law applies to uh, non-residents as well as residents of Hong Kong. If you have permanent residency in Hong Kong, you are going to be subject to the same treatment as local residents. If you do not have permanent residency in Hong Kong, then you could be deported plus some other kind of punishments unspecified. Essentially, according to Jerry Cohen, again, that this, and actually according to the Don Clark, another uh, legal scholar, that this is Beijing exercising extraterritorial jurisdiction. How, why? Essentially, one thing I think is precisely because Hong Kongers in the past year have been very effective, very organized in mobilizing for international support, mobilizing for Washington support, London support, EU parliamentarian support, Japanese support for the protests going on. And so this is why Beijing added the collusion charge. And at the same time that the, Beijing has long been saying that, you know, we are really nice. We uh, don't worry about China's rise. This is really our peaceful rise. And think about Confucius, Confu you know, we are a Confucian training culture and, and Confu Confucianism always preaches peace. And so don't worry about it. And a lot of people bought that argument about China's soft power. But several years ago, the National Endowment for Democracy already said that while Beijing was, you know, not really using its military, was not sending anyone out in uniform, but this is really sharp power using economic coercion. What uh, is striking about this law is that Beijing doesn't even bother with only economic coercion, but also using the law to repress people so that people will silence themselves. So I am, I, so after the, the BBC booked me to, to speak at, at the six, six o'clock news and the producer called me in a little bit and said, are you sure that, you know, we don't want you to subject you to life imprisonment and worse. And so uh, a lot of people are silenced. A lot of people I know actually have erased every traces of them ever seeing anything. Um, Michael, what about the academic community outside of Hong Kong that looks in? For example, you, you're associated uh, with Jindal University. Um, how do people there feel about this? How does the academic community around the world feel about this? There must be a reaction. They all know about it and they must all be concerned. Am I right? Oh, yes. I get a lot of, I mean, I'm also associated with Columbia University. Uh, I think in general, both in America and in India, the two examples we've mentioned here, uh, there's a lot of concern. I've actually been on a, a TV program in India as well to talk about this and scholars, uh, India, because it's a, a less developed country, has in some sense admired China because China's rapid economic development. And so a country like India faces this dilemma, do we become more hardline to be like China or do we s insist on uh, staying with our Indian democracy? And I think the sentiment in India is to be more democratic but at the same time, there's certainly a kind of populist leadership now that tilts the other way. So this, China's presenting its neighbors with a dilemma. And of course, China has uh, had an open conflict with India on the border. So th this is the, the context. So what about academics going to Hong Kong, uh, conducting inter you know, uh, academic exchange and so on? I think it's, it's a tough question. We, we don't know yet 
what the impact will be. But we know that, as Victoria just pointed out, that this law reaches non-residents and residents alike. It applies to everybody in the world, even you, Jay. Journalists are worried about this, uh, about whether if they say or do things uh, about Hong Kong and China's uh, practices in Hong Kong, will there be some kind of consequence? So academics face the same question. And right now, it, it's an unknown uh, exactly what the risks are. And so if, if and when they start arresting academics or journalists, then I think uh, all bets will be off. That, uh, then at that point, everybody will assume they cannot go to Hong Kong where they could risk being arrested. So, uh, Victoria, what, what, you know, what, what effect in the business community in Hong Kong? I, I, have, um, I have a recollection that uh, back in, uh, what, 1997, um, the PRC sort of um, undermined the business community by offering them special arrangements and uh, special deals, and uh, that way they assuaged them into, into the takeover. Um, is that happening again? Um, is, is the PRC offering the business community special deals and funds and arrangements so as to, uh, you know, suborn them to, to undermine their, uh, any alliance they might have with the, with the people who are calling for democracy? Well, there's no question that because China has en enormous economic power, so it's been using economic coercion, even before the law was promulgated, people were compelled to line up to pledge support for the law. They didn't know what, you know, what the law said, but they were told to, to, do, to, to pledge support. So Hong Kong's richest man, Li ka uh, he pledged support. HSBC, along with the standard charter, these British banks, um, because they, most of the businesses are done in Hong Kong, most of the profits are made in Hong Kong. They also were made to pledge support. And what is really striking, as I mentioned too, that so the, the new regulations released today are striking in the sense that not just that you, uh, that re residents, if you criticize the Beijing, that you are vulnerable to repression, imprisonment, uh, torture, and, and more, but that international businesses, they are especially uh, information provider, that if there's any any uh, material involved, uh, you know, because the definition of collusion, uh, subversion, secession, terrorism is so broad, and anyone who provides assistance can also get into trouble. So these international providers are, are told that they have to provide information. They do not have the rights to remain silent. And if they do not cooperate, they are subject to heavy fines as well as imprisonment. This is essentially telling the international community that, you know, follow my way or you get into trouble. Why would Beijing want to do that? Apparently, they really want to cut off Hong Kong. They don't care about the business and economic environment anymore. Yeah. What about the people in the street, the people in the umbrella movement? Um, all those uh, relatively young people who have protested, a lot of them students, um, how have they taken this? Uh, I, I, you know, are there, are there have been indications uh, in the news that they have withdrawn from protest organizations. They've resigned from, from uh, roles in protest organizations and they're backing off and trying to disappear so they don't get prosecuted. It, it sounds like uh, this is having the desired effect and that people are really, really intimidated in the streets of Hong Kong. Am I right? You are quite right. Essentially, the law, as you, you know, the, all the provision uh, uh, advocates have been saying that the, the law has to be really, really harsh to have the, the, the desired deterrence effect. And then the demonstrators, for example, you talk about the young people who are the forefront of first the, um, the anti-national education campaign in 2012 and then the umbrella movement in 2014. They disbanded immediately, just several hours before the national security law was passed. And at the same time, and, and at the same time, the, uh, some students were also trying to organize boy class boycotts and medical workers in different unions. They were newly formed and they were trying to also organize strikes, but people were intimidated. And so yeah. what about the people who are not intimidated, who, who have still been protesting since July 1st, and they're all subject to arrest. So because the, the, the government's banned the slogan, uh, liberate Hong Kong revolution of our times. And so yesterday, people were just holding up blank sheets of white paper. And even those people were arrested. So essentially, oh, oh, really? yes, yeah, so there is really no, no freedom of expression in Hong Kong. <laughs> even a white sheet. But paper. what is important is that Beijing apparently this time is not satisfied with just shutting people up that they do not have the rights to remain silence, but it's also reaching the heavy arms to international businesses. Even the rights to property rights can, is also in jeopardy now. Yeah. 
So, Michael, what's left? You know, uh, pe people are going to be very intimidated and they're right to be intimidated. They'll wind up in a retraining facility. They'll wind up being tried, you know, extradited summarily, tried uh, uh, in mainland China and sent to retraining or prison for a long time for a really minor, um, you know, First Amendment conscious expression. Uh, what's left for them? Well, this is the big uh, question that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to see as this thing evolves. Uh, the, the message seems to be quite clear, for example, that uh, if they engage in any kind of protest, no matter how, uh, you know, innocuous it may appear, that they could be arrested and charged, and they charged with very serious crimes, because the punishment for these four crimes range from three years to life in prison. Uh, and if they're drugged across the border to the mainland, it could possibly be the case that they, because then the national laws apply, the Hong Kong law stops applying. None of the national security laws, they could be executed. So it's, it's very severe. Now the British have, have uh, you know, offered a, an escape route because they're saying that all Hong Kongers who hold this passport, the BNO passport, could then uh, go to Britain and establish citizenship there. So, and that reaches about 3 million Hong Kong people, uh, nearly half the population. It, as I understand, it includes their family members, so maybe more than half the population. Uh, of course, Hong Kong people don't all want to move to Britain, but uh, it, given the situation that's evolving, there will be a lot of them wanting to do that. And so Chinese officials now have proclaimed that they're going to impose an exit uh, permit requirement to try to stop people from leaving. So uh, they, this is a very relentless effort to repress and contain any opposition in Hong Kong. Uh, and so the pretense in the basic law that Hong Kong people would be ruling Hong Kong has been thrown out the window. Completely. How about the U.S.? Has the U.S. offered the people who want to leave any sanctuary? Well, the U.S. Uh, right now is kind of ambiguous in that. I mean, the Congress is uh, trying to enact laws that would offer asylum, but then we know the current administration is has virtually no asylum cases, so we don't know whether anything done in Congress will result in anything done. On, uh, in, in the White House, uh, whether they will be uh, execution. Let me add to this is that, um, so uh, Hong Kongers, as I said before, that have become very organized and very supportive of what is going on in Hong Kong. And that has invited Beijing's also the crime of collusion, but precisely because of the crime of collusion. So then we actually have to step up our work. Um, Hong Kong people in, in the US have formed the Hong Kong Democracy Council we have been very effective at pushing for the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and amendments to the Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992. And just in the past week, we also managed to get the Hong Kong Autonomy Act passed by Congress. And then essentially because these acts are passed by both uh, unanimously, and so therefore they are veto-proof by the, by the president. But still, passing the acts is one thing. A lot of those acts when empowered, the administration, the president has to translate them into policies. And that is also where, you know, maybe American voters can also do help, help with that. Um, another bill that, that um, we are pushing for is the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act and the Hong Kong People Freedom and, and Choice Act. And these acts would, would give asylum and refugee status to Hong Kongers, whether they apply from Hong Kong or they are here in the US. And at the same time, if there's enough American support, then those acts can get passed. And then at the same time, I think ultimately even the president who's been calling President Xi Jinping, my friend, my buddy, I like it, I like him, I think he likes me too, would also then translate um, these acts into new policies. Now, Victoria, how does this all intersect with COVID? Because every day the headline is about COVID around the world, including in Hong Kong, including in China. Um, so how does it intersect? I mean, is it, could it be that uh, Xi Jinping wanted to do this at a time when we had a pandemic? Uh, how does the pandemic affect all these events we've been talking about? I think you're quite right that China got hit by the coronavirus first, uh, and then it, it also recovered early. And then by the time it was recovering, then the, the, the virus actually got spread to Europe and the US and, the, and you know, with mismanagement, um, the US is now really suffering even more and new spikes. And so definitely, I, I would say that China calculates, Beijing calculates that your people, people may care about what happens in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, in Taiwan, and, uh, and the Indian Chinese border. 
if they are just sitting around with extra money and extra attention, but if they themselves do not have jobs, they worry about, you know, what happens, you know, when we get up in the morning, then people have to will pay very little attention to what goes on around the world, especially we know that Americans tend to pay less attention to international news than Europeans. But again, Beijing could have done this law uh, through other ways by pushing it through the Legislative Council, and then the world would probably have preferred to look the other way. But it has taken the most blatant approach so that the world cannot look the other way. So I think that this is backfiring. And I'm thinking that maybe you know the new regulations by even depriving people of the rights to 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 preserving their private property, maybe that will get get so backfired that you know um, different countries are providing exit for Hong Kongers, and Hong Kong will lose its autonomous status, and then Beijing will wind up with an empty shell. Yeah, I think. Oh, my, my, go ahead. I think an important issue here is uh, there's been a contest going on in the world between the Beijing model. And the sort of free market model that the American uh, United States has long sponsored. And a lot of poor, underdeveloped countries sometimes may think, well, the Beijing, you know, let's cooperate with Beijing, let's work with Beijing because this is going to be uh, to our advantage. Uh, I think what's happening in Hong Kong is kind of a microcosm of what the price of the Beijing model is. You know, when there's a big country like China and it's getting richer and, you know, we're obviously doing better than it was during the more extreme periods in the past, then people might say, well, look at this. This is quite successful. I know a lot of my friends in India would in recent years look at Shanghai skyline and say, wow, that looks a lot better uh, than Mumbai. Uh, and so they, they're they impressed with it. But I think what we're seeing here in the Hong Kong example is that that this is is much more than just you know getting rich, that there's a real heavy price to pay for following that model. And, and mm -hmm. I think, uh, so in some ways, Hong Kong is, uh, has uh, very pointy elbows and it's finding its way into international attention in spite of uh, COVID-19. Well, that's good. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, about uh, the, the long plan for, for China and for Xi Jinping. Um, so we have seen them take over Tibet and uh, repress Tibet. Um, we have seen them um, push Taiwan around um, unsuccessfully lately. Uh, we have seen them uh, on the Mekong uh, affecting the, the river and energy in, in the Southeast Asia. Um, and most recently, we've seen them on the border in the Himalayas uh, fighting over a border with India. Uh, in each case, expanding. And of course, we have the Belt and Road Initiative and we have the East China Sea and the South China Sea and all that. All this stuff is happening under Xi Jinping. And it all seems to have a common denominator, and that is he wants to expand China's geography and China's influence all over the world. Isn't this part of that? Isn't this part of a larger expansion plan by Xi Jinping? I would say, and let me explain that. I think I would say that this is Xi Jinping's China dream. Because when he came to power, he was talking about the China dream, the dream of reviving China's historical greatness. But essentially, you know, it is about essentially, and this is also why that he abolished the term limits several years ago. And so that he, in his view that, you know, if I can reign in Tibet, I can reign in Xinjiang, I can reign in Hong Kong. I cannot, and many people, will be, including me, believe that if Hong Kong, if nobody really cares about Hong Kong, just as they look the other way from the re-education camps in Xinjiang, then the next would be Beijing, well, so, sorry, would be Taiwan. And so after all of that, then essentially in all the surrounding areas, and then this is, you know, China's revival of greatness, this is history, and then he'll go down in history as the greatest ever Chinese leader. Yeah, he makes, him, he makes himself out to be like Mao. He wrote himself into the constitution, gave special preference to his words. Uh, he extended his term. Uh, he's a lot different than uh, Deng Xiaoping and, and Hu, Hu Jintai. Um, he's really looking for expansion here. And so, so is this about China or is it about Xi Jinping trying to make himself an, an emperor for life uh, and uh, giving himself the legacy of an expanded China? I would say that he's way more than Mao. As I said, he really wants to go down in history as the greatest leader of all time, from the beginning of the, of the, of the first empire of the Qing dynasty all the way down. And, 
Chinese emperors have always had this desire, every single one of them says that I can do something that my predecessors could not do. I think this is what Xi Jinping wants to achieve, is that I'm at the long line of this Chinese history. I'm going to make China the greatest ever. The only problem is that a lot of the recent actions in particular have really backfired. So just two days ago, again, uh, we, have, we have seen a lot of China scholars who've long really criticized containment, who've all long championed uh, a, a engagement, including, for example, uh, UCSD Susan Shu. And she said, with Hong Kong, I can see that this completely fundamentally changes my understanding of what China stands for and how the US should react to this. And also beginning from last fall, I was, uh, when I testified at the Congress on, on September 4th last year, I said that, you know, the world now, fi Washington finally now talks about the China reckoning. They should have looked at Hong Kong. Hong Kong represents, the Hong Kong reckoning represents what the China reckoning should look like. So do you think Congress is going to do anything about this? Do you think Trump is going to do anything? Well, the Congress is very, as I said, Congress is really very united in support, behind supporting Hong Kong. And of course, we know that uh, Republicans and Democrats pretty much hate each other on every single issue. The one thing that unites them is Hong Kong. So all of these acts have had by bipartisan support. The only question is, is all of these acts, you know, so far have not really been translated into policies except for two baby steps. The first baby step that that's the administration took was that they're going to impose these sanctions on, on uh, Chinese officials. Well, Xi Jinping's dog already graduated from Harvard, so he doesn't care. He doesn't have another young daughter. Maybe, you know, he's his grandkid, but who cares? <laughs> And then the second in policy is, is to um, put a ban on the export of dual-use technologies to Hong Kong because a lot of state-owned enterprises have been using Hong Kong to then bring in dual-use technologies, you know, to import them into Hong Kong, turn them around and bring them across the border. These are baby steps. If Beijing is essentially completely killing Hong Kong, then, you know, why should Hong Kong continue to, why should the world allow Beijing to, to enjoy all the privileges that Hong Kong has uh, based on this autonomous status. So Victoria, if I want to know more about this, if, if I want to see, um, you know, uh, your testimony, uh, if I want to uh, uh, connect up and maybe help uh, some of these organizations that have been formed, uh, where do I go? Where do I look? Uh, well, well, follow my blog is Victoria TB Hoi. It's a Victoria T and B and the H-U-I dot WordPress dot com. And also follow the work of Hong Kong Democracy Council, go to the Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We have been basically taking a lot of these actions that are very important for, you know, essentially, we need the world to pay attention to Hong Kong. To Hong Kong. Otherwise, uh, Hong Kong would be sent into, into like Xinjiang and Tibet. And then despite the, the, the threat of collusion, Hong Kong people in the US are very, very determined. So Michael, you and I have talked about this so many times, you know, and each time our discussion, well, it's it's sadder. <laughs> each yes. time, each time yes. this is a greater yes. tragedy than before. Yes. Um, and it has all, you know, the elements of a, of a Greek or, or, or Roman tragedy, yes. uh, um, operatic, if you will. Uh, where are we going on this? Have you got a sense of, of, of direction? Have you got a sense of what the future will bring? Well, I think it's, it's the, one of those kinds of debates where people cannot really give up. I mean, you and I, being abroad, we could go visit a country, pick any, and we can see their problems and maybe be horrified and think, well, there's nothing that these people are going to lose. They, they, can't, they can't do anything about this. It's horrible. Uh, when you're there, you can't do that. When you're there, when you're the people of that place and these things are happening, then you're really motivated to stick with it and address it. Uh, two possibilities. One is people will take to the streets there in Hong Kong and perhaps overload the jails. And, and uh, instead of being uh, hospitals overloaded in Hong Kong, it'll be jails. Uh, or if the situation is, in their view, so hopeless on the ground, then they're going to flee. Uh, and they will either leave the Hong Kong uh, legally uh, without having some exit problems, or they'll take to boats and leave Hong Kong but they will leave. And if they're overseas, then they're going to be a huge overseas constituency influencing political leaders around the world like Victoria's organization does uh, to pay attention to Hong Kong and the congressional bodies to pay attention and so on. So this is kind of where it's headed. Uh, it didn't have to go to this. 
But quite frankly, I've always believed that if China was simply carried out what was in its basic law, uh, allowing Hong Kong people to rule Hong Kong, trust their judgment a bit, uh, then there would have not developed such an extreme opposition as we saw last year. That opposition last year was the, the, an expression of total frustration with what Beijing is doing. And this year, that frustration is turning into fear uh, because of Beijing's more extreme response and continuing erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy to the point now where they've essentially taken it away entirely. So, so this is where the game is right now. Uh, but I expect people will keep working at this one. I mean, we have another example uh, that we all know, which are Tibetans. 70 years later, they're still organized around the world in, in what to the rest of us may seem sometimes hopeless. But if you're one of the people that's affected in this way, hopelessness is not an option. Yeah. yeah. I also want to just add that, um, I, so I wrote another piece in, on, the eve, on the eve of the national security laws in Netman. And I was thinking that, my God, because I also teach courses on different democracy movements around the world. And it occurred to me that Hong Kong has become even more repressive than South Africa during apartheid, more repressive than uh, Prague uh, under Soviet control, more uh, repressive than Burma under the, uh, uh, under the, the hunter regime, military hunter regime and almost as, as bad as uh, Denmark during Nazi occupation. And then, but in every single one of these cases, when people don't give up, so Aung San Suu Kyi, before she became a defender of genocide, she also championed freedom from fear, that we have to basically make sure that we keep the fire, uh, the, fight, the, the fighting going. And at the same time, so long as we do not give up, we haven't failed. And this you is know, actually the message that people have really um, been kind of like ingrained in mind. It strikes me that this is not only a test of the people of Hong Kong and Hong Kong as a society. It's also a test of the world in the way the world watches and hopefully acts on this. It's a, it's a global test. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. I hope we can uh, circle back at a later time and and catch other events, which I'm sure will be equally interesting or, or frightening as the case may be. Thank you so much, Michael, Victoria, aloha. You're welcome.